where they strung up a man, who they say he murdered three. Strange things have happened there. No stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Chris James. Given enough coffee, I could conquer the world. Well, that and a huge army and all the latest technology and weapons. I really don't want to rule the world. Too much responsibility. I'm happy just trying to run my own brain, which is a huge challenge. Great, now my cats are fighting. If I did want to conquer anything, I would use Organic Man Coffee Trike as my supplier. The best coffee in the universe. Well, the planet, according to Annabelle Lee. Swing by 4501 McPherson and get a cup or ten. If it's too far to go, you can go to OrganicManCoffeeTrike.shop. Consume and enjoy. I want to know why so many sites today are doing war with ad blockers. I know they make their money by bombarding us with commercials and things that we don't need or want, but so many sites will allow you to have a real quick glimpse into their site, and then all of a sudden it'll say, oh, you're using ad blockers, you can't look at us. Mm. I simply close the page and I go looking elsewhere. If they don't want us visiting, then put some kind of an icon on the search page just so I don't even open the darn thing. A red circle and a slash over a capital A-B. Ad blockers need not look. I was on Paranormal Roundtable with Josh Turner, Michael Anthony, and Anthony Moreno. We were talking about tulpas and how some people said these were thought forms uh, created as people focused their attention on some, until that moment, unreal creature. I had said something about unseen beings that took on the shape of other creatures as a way of feeding on fear. Anthony Moreno said maybe the Tulpas were actually these invisible beings reading people's minds and creating the things that folks were focusing on. Well, something like that. It got me to thinking about imaginary play friends. Imaginary friends, sometimes known as pretend friends, invisible friends or made-up friends, are a psychological and social phenomena where a friendship or other interpersonal relationship takes place in the imagination rather than in the physical reality. Some kids find making real friends a bit hard while others want somebody around unlike the available kids in the neighborhood. Although they may seem real to their creators, children usually understand their imaginary friends are not real. At least, that's what the experts tell us. The first studies focusing on imaginary friends are supposed to have been conducted in the 1890s. Uh, there is little research about the concept of imaginary friends in kids' imagination. Clausen and Paceman report imaginary companions were originally described as being supernatural creatures and spirits that were thought to connect people with their past lives. Adults in history have had entities uh, such as household gods, guardian angels, and muses that functioned as imaginary companions to provide comfort, guidance, and inspiration for creative work. There is also the phenomenon of the third man. On July 10th, 2020, I did a whole show about that unexplained occurrence. 
It is possible that the phenomenon appeared among children in the mid-19th century when childhood was emphasized as an important time for play and imagination. Some of these unseen playmates are just there to play or sometimes help keep the real kids from harm. You might call them our guardian angels or protectors from beyond. As a writer, I get to talk to a lot of people with stories of things their kids told them. On occasion, these childish stories took on a whole new paranormal aspect. Some of these stories, I just went with what they had told me. Others, I gave them assumed names, and you know what assume means. Anyway, I used the names to tell their stories without their getting any unwanted notoriety. Some people will tell me that they want their names in writing, and others are like, please don't mention my name. When a little girl named Sarah first began to talk, she told her folks about a friend of hers named Saw Saw, uh, who would come and play with her. Sarah would talk to Saw Saw from the time she awoke until it was time for bed. What both parents found amazing was how Sarah was so well behaved, never crying at night or acting up. No public meltdowns, as she was abnormally well-adjusted. The folks playing along with the kid, seeing as this imaginary friend, seemed to make her happy. The situation did get a bit out of hand, as Sarah would insist that Sasa be given a place at the table during mealtime. Sasa would take a bath with her and sleep beside her. As Sarah got old enough to communicate intelligently, the parents began to suspect that there might be more going on than just imagination. One day, while their daughter and Saw Saw were playing dolls, Nicole let them know that lunch was ready. As was her habit, she called both names. It was all just fun and games, right? Sarah grew up a bit, thinking of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and Saw Saw as all being real. As she entered the kitchen, Sarah told her mother her friend's name was not Saw Saw, it was Sasha. And Nicole was somewhat taken aback. Sasha means defender of mankind, and it can be given to a boy or a girl. What Nicole was surprised by was, years ago she had been pregnant, and that child was going to be named Sasha. The baby didn't make it to term. Neither parent had ever told Sarah about this unborn sister. Nicole began to believe that her daughters had somehow found each other. Uh, Kevin, the husband, wasn't as quick to accept this scenario, but after looking back on things that Sarah had said and done over the years, the pieces began to fit together. In the hopes of learning about this child who they never knew, they started pressing Sarah for more information. They asked their daughter so many questions that instead of answering, Sarah retreated inside herself. She refused to speak to either parent, uh, focusing her full attention on Sasha. The folks decided it would be best to stop asking questions about this girl that they couldn't see and try focusing on Sarah, the one that they could. One day, while she was sitting on the floor playing a board game with her daughter, Nicole asked Sarah if she remembered the first time she met Sasha. To her surprise, her daughter piped up with an answer. She said that Sasha had been at the hospital the day she was born. Nicole informed her ever so gently that she wouldn't have been able to remember such a thing. 
Sarah, thoroughly exasperated with her mother, told her that she knew that it happened, not because she could remember the occasion, but because Sasha had told her so. Nicole was able to piece together the story of how her living daughter, and the one who had died before birth, came to forge an unbreakable bond. From what she could gather, Sarah did not realize that Sasha was her sister. She had always referred to her only as her best friend. She did know that Sasha was a soul that lacked a body. She knew this because it was how Sasha had described herself. Nicole was curious if Sasha appeared to her sister as a little girl or as an adult. This question was beyond Sarah's ability to answer. So she said that Sasha glowed like a light. She was a light being. This was not a light bulb, but a bright thing with emotions and reasoning ability. As Sarah got older, she began asking Sasha to show herself to her folks. Uh, Sasha said that she wasn't supposed to present herself to others. Sarah was the only one allowed to see her. As far as I could find, Sarah and Sasha are still together today. They interact on their own private terms, and the rest of the world is welcome to go on around them. Would this qualify as being an imaginary friend or more of a ghost encounter? Uh, something to think about the next time your kid is playing by themselves, but they're not alone. I listen to Trailer Trash Terrors, and I wonder, would the characters like Boudreaux and Beelzebubba and Annabelle Lee uh, qualify as being Vic Hermanson's imaginary friends? <laughs> as, are they just in his head, or are they more real than we can imagine? Jacqueline said she had an imaginary friend while growing up in Oklahoma. Her grandmother, June, lived in a small home with a small backyard. Jacqueline would visit on occasion, and she would stay for several days at a time. She did all the things grandkids are supposed to do, things like learning about country life. Her grandfather, Hank, would tell her stories some true and some that he just made up. They would sit under a tree in the yard and he would tell her all about living and growing up during Prohibition. Revenuers and bootleggers, things folks live in, living in town would only read about. These stories became a huge part of Jacqueline's life. She looked forward to visiting her grandfather more and more. Uh, Jacqueline had been born in 1982. Her grandfather had died in 1981. Just a slight inconvenience there. Uh, Jacqueline wasn't the only one who knew that her grandfather was there. Uh, she was only one that he would actually talk to. Hank had died at home, which was how it used to be. And on the anniversary of his passing, June would go into town and stay with some friends. I hear from people all the time who have young kids that see dead grandparents. Is this imagination or, once again, a ghost that comes to visit? We had a Halloween event at the Mercado in downtown Laredo several years ago. The city wanted people to come to the event, but they still charged way too much money for parking. We had to run outside every two hours and feed the meters. Anything to squeeze a few more bucks out of us. While at the event, I met Blanca, her daughter, and granddaughter. And they told me the following stories. I had many of my readers, like uh, Philip Barnes, uh, found these stories to be fascinating. He won a book from me while listening to Paranormal Roundtable. He was reading about Yaya, and he sent me a message asking about her. I'll read the story just the way I wrote it, 
in Blanca's words. We spent hours back and forth trying to get these stories straight, and uh, I really don't feel like re-editing them again. Blanca said, When my granddaughter Esmeralda was small, maybe four years old, she had an imaginary friend. It all started one night as I was talking to my daughter Perla on the phone. My daughter said that Esmeralda was acting strange. I asked what she meant. A Perla nearly broke out in tears as she told me that Esme is talking as if there is someone else in the room. She's having an entire conversation all by herself. I'm scared of what is going on. I told my daughter, don't be scared. Ask her who is she talking with. My daughter only responded, I'm scared. I told her to put the phone on speaker so that I could talk to Esme. I asked Esme, who are you talking to? She said, Yaya. I asked, who is she? Esme said, my friend, but I'm telling her not to look at my mom, but she keeps staring at her. Esme sounded as if she were mad by this activity. The Sunday I took Esme home with me, and I kept asking her questions. I asked, who was Yaya, and where did they meet? Esme said Yaya was her friend. I asked, how old was Yaya, and Esme said she was about five. I asked, what did Yaya look like, and Esme said, I can't see her face. I asked why not, to which Esme said, her hair is covering her rostro. We do speak Spanish around home. I thought about Esme using the word rostro, which means face. I thought about it, and I decided that we had never used rostro, and there was no way that Esme should know, let alone use this word. We had used cara on many occasions, but never rostro. Rostro is more like a visage or a continence. This led to more questions. Blanca asked, Esme, what happened to Yaya? Esme said, Her and her little brother were taking a bath when her dad threw a radio into the water. They both died, and that was why she keeps her face covered. It's all burned. I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I asked, well, where is Yaya right now? I could see Esme was looking at someone or something uh, right in front of her and shaking her head. Esme told me, she's here with me in the tub. I said, okay. I told Esme, now get the washcloth and give it to Yaya and uh, tell her she'll have to scrub herself because I can't see her. Esme grabbed the washcloth and then handed it to where Yaya was supposed to be. Grandma said you'll have to wash yourself because she can't see you. I took Esme out of the tub so she could get ready for bed. Esme wanted Yaya to get ready as well. I told my granddaughter, tell Yaya that she can stay here as long as she wants to, but she's going to have to be a good girl or she will have to leave. Esme looked at me and said, she heard you and she said okay. One day as I was cooking, I had Esme sitting at the table coloring. As she was talking with herself or rather her friend. I finished cooking, and I served her some food. Esme asked me, Grandma, Yaya is hungry too. I asked her, where is she? And Esme pointed to the chair next to her, and she said she's right there. I got a small plate and served a small portion of food. I never saw the spoon move or the food get eaten, but it was a bit strange serving a ghost. One day, my son Juan was playing a video game. Esme came wandering into his room and 
He watched for a bit. She then asked, Can we play with your game? He looked at her and asked who the we were. Her and who else? To which Esme said, Me and Yaya. Juan looked at his niece and asked, Where's Yaya? Esme pointed to the area right next to him and said, She's standing next to you. I was in the kitchen when my son came running in all scared. I looked at him and asked what was wrong, and Juan told me that Esme scared me with Yaya. I asked him how come she scared him, and Juan said I asked her where was Yaya, and she pointed next to me and said she was standing right there. I laughed and told Juan to not be afraid. Yaya wouldn't do anything. Juan was still shook up and said it still scared the heck out of him. When my daughter picked my granddaughter up on the weekends, I would tell Esmeralda to take Yaya with her. One night, my husband and I were leaving to head over to a club. My three sons were not home, and I was the last one out the door. I turned off the lights, and I was walking to the front door when I entered a cold spot. All the hair on my arms stood up, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I practically ran out the door, thinking that I was not alone anymore. My husband looked at me and asked, What in the world is wrong with you? And I told him something was behind me. I could feel it following me as I walked through the house. It felt mean and angry. Yaya went everywhere with my granddaughter. Everywhere. She would go to my niece's house when they would babysit Esmeralda. Joanna would take care of Esme any time me and my daughter were both working or we were too busy during the day. One day I had Esme when my niece called my daughter and asked her, Why did she drop Esme off without telling her? My daughter told her she hadn't dropped Esme off. Esme was with her grandmother. My niece had been looking at the camera that showed the front door to her house. She had seen a little girl standing there waiting to be let in and simply thought it had to be Esmeralda. When my niece opened the door, there was nobody there. She looked all around the yard and even out in the street, but there was no one. Going back inside, she looked at the camera once more. Again, the little girl was standing there. My niece went back to the front door, thinking that maybe Esme had hidden or something. Once more, there was nobody at the door. After doing this a few more times, my niece said to tell Esme to take Yaya with her, and from now on, don't bring her to her house. Esme was attending school across the street from my house. She stayed with me during school days and then went with her mother during summer vacation. When Esme left for school, Yaya stayed in my house. She was apparently upset that her friend wasn't there to play with. Yaya began doing things. In the hallway stood an altar in memory of my sister who had passed away. There were some angel figurines and pictures and candles. I was sitting in the living room with my son Marco. We were the only ones, well, the only living people, in the house. As we were watching TV, we heard noises coming from the hallway. As we were about to go look for the cause, the angel figurines and all the things on the altar came flying through the room, landing by the couch. My son and I looked at each other, lost as to what had just happened. As I began picking stuff up, I told my sister Janie that she didn't have to throw things around, but I really knew that it was Yaya. The next incident took place shortly after I got sick and I was bedridden for almost three weeks. My son Marco was with me in my room watching TV, and suddenly we heard what sounded like the couch being moved. It sounded as if someone were dragging the furniture in the living room back and forth across the floor. 
I told my son to go see what or who was making all of that noise. He looked at me and said, Nope, if they want to move the furniture around, let them, but I'm not going. After listening to the sounds for too long, we decided maybe we should have a look after all. We both got up and went and looked. We checked the living room over. The weird thing was nothing appeared to have been moved. The couch was in the same position, and there was nothing that could have made all the noise that we had heard. We clearly heard it being drug about by some unknown entity, but everything was right where it belonged. After living in that same house for eight years, we moved to my parents' home. I had been diagnosed with lupus, fibromyalgia, and RA, all at the same time, and my mother was diagnosed with cancer. We thought Yaya had left for good since no one had said anything about her in a long time. One day, a friend of my son Louis saw her when he came to visit. It was on his second visit that Louis told me what his friend had said. He told me, Mom, my friend saw Yaya standing in the hallway. I answered, he did? The guy said, yes, I was talking to Lewis, and from the corner of my eye, I saw a little girl standing in the hallway. I asked him, how did she look? And just to verify what he was going to say, Lewis's friend said, she had a white dress, and her hair was hanging down over her face. I was like, Okay, she's back. Then, on two different occasions, friends of my son's asked, What is your niece doing outside at three o'clock in the morning? Lewis said, My niece doesn't go outside at that time. You must have seen Yaya, the little girl that lives in our house. They were shocked, and I guess that was what got them to stop coming over to the house any time after dark. My granddaughter Esmeralda is now 18, and she hasn't seen Yaya in years. She does have the ability to see spirits and shadows. My other granddaughter, Jasmine, is like us. She also has the ability to see them as well. A couple of months ago, she was sitting in the kitchen, and out of the corner of her eye, she saw Yaya walking across the room on the other side of the table. When she tried to look directly at her, the girl disappeared. It sounds as if Yaya wasn't an imaginary friend, but a ghost of a child killed by her father. She must have liked Esmeralda and her family since uh, she followed them all over town. In around 1970, Letty had a friend who would visit her when she was from three to eight years of age. She used to see a little boy in the backyard while staying at her grandmother's house. She said, I like to spend time playing or drawing by myself. So often when I was playing by myself in the backyard, I would play with this boy who looked to be about my age. It was not like an imaginary friend. I could actually see him. She went on to say, he would come from behind the large trees that my grandmother had. The backyard was quite big, and she had lots of plants and trees. This boy was slim. He had dark brown, short hair, brown eyes, and tanned skin. He always wore a red short-sleeved shirt and short navy blue pants. He was always smiling, but he never spoke. He just played. I always could tell when he would come to play. I just don't know how I knew. I don't believe it was a real person, because I'm sure my grandmother would have noticed a stranger playing with her granddaughter in her backyard. You were able to see the backyard from the kitchen and the back bedroom. The backyard was surrounded by a tall wall made from cement blocks on two sides, in a tall fence on the third. How a boy three or even eight years old could get over the wall or the fence was beyond anybody's ability to figure out.
Sometime after she was eight years old, thereabouts, her friend simply stopped showing up. A man, I'm going to call him Lenny, I told... <laughs> tell me about the rabbits, George, of mice and men, for those of you that read. Lenny moved to Georgia in 1990s. His brother moved to Georgia the following year. I'll call the brother George. Uh, George moved into an old house built in the 1800s. The house looked okay from the curb, but inside there was an odd vibe that felt wrong. Lenny helped move George and his family into their new old home. Lenny would hear whispers from time to time. He encountered a few cold spots inside the old house as well. Lenny asked George if he had heard or seen anything odd in the old house. Uh, George wasn't having any of this paranormal stuff. Later, after they were settled in, George began having a few experiences as well. Nothing real scary, just things to let him know that maybe the place had a life of its own. One day, while George's four-year-old niece was visiting, she went missing. A quick search of the area found her walking along a busy road, holding her arm halfway up in the air at her side, like she was holding someone's hand. George ran over to her and asked why she had walked away from the house, and she said that she was walking with the old lady who lived in the house. George looked around, trying to spot any stranger who might have been with his niece, and then he called the police. The police investigated the incident, and when asked, the four-year-old explained that she had gone for a stroll with the old lady that lived in their house. The old woman had asked her to go walking with her, and so she did. George checked the front door. It was a bit too much for a four-year-old to be able to unlock and open. When asked, the niece said the old woman had unlocked and then opened the door for her. She also said there was a dog on the porch, and George didn't have a dog. The niece had an imaginary friend and an imaginary dog. Got me to wondering, how many kids have imaginary pets? I'm not talking about dragons or unicorns. I'm, you know, the normal kind of pets, dogs or cats, but only they can see them. I'm going to call this next couple Herman and Lily. They had a young daughter named Marilyn. I know, but they had a daughter, not a son. Marilyn was a well-behaved kid, never crying or having fits at night. Sound familiar? Herman managed to buy the family a new home. The place was cheaper than any of the houses around it, but this was just written off as being a fluke. They got lucky, maybe. Shortly after moving in, Marilyn said that she had a new friend named Fanny. Nobody could see Fanny, so the parents decided this must be an imaginary friend. Any time something got broken, Marilyn said that her new friend Fanny had done it. The parents knew better. Well, at least they hoped that they did. The shadows would be seen moving about the hallway when there was nobody around to cast them. Marilyn told her parents that Fanny didn't really want them in the house. After some time there, Marilyn told her mother that Fanny had been hurt by her mother while in the bathtub. Lely began to suspect that Marilyn might need some professional help, like a head shrinker. Returning home one day, the family found all of their pictures had been removed from the walls and piled in the middle of the living room floor. The doors and windows were all locked. Nobody could have gotten in, yet all the pictures were taken down and moved. But by who? Herman saw a face 
a very white face, looking in the window one evening. It vanished as soon as he focused on it. He asked Lily, and she said that she had seen it before on a different night. Lily sent Marilyn to stay with her grandmother one weekend so they could redecorate her bedroom. Paint followed by new furniture. Marilyn got home and was thrilled by her new room. As soon as Herman and Lily were downstairs, they heard a huge crashing sound uh, coming from Marilyn's room. Entering, they found the room had been turned upside down. Marilyn was way too small to have done this much damage. She said Fanny did it. Fanny was mad about something. One day, Marilyn asked Fanny, had told her to jump out the second floor window. Herman immediately nailed all of the windows shut on the second floor. Right in front of their eyes, Herman and Lily saw Marilyn suddenly get drugged backwards into the basement. This was just too much, so Lily called around until she found a medium that she thought was trustworthy. The medium said all the things that mediums say when they really don't know what they're doing. Someone died violently, and there's unfinished business, and, you know, poltergeist stuff. Well, Marilyn was way too young to be experiencing poltergeist activity. Late one night, Herman felt himself suddenly being possessed by unseen forces. He had a sudden violent urge to attack. Lily did the smart thing and ran out the door. As soon as Herman got out the door, the feelings vanished. It was time to go. Uh, tell Fanny that she is not invited along. They moved to a new, newer house, and uh, it seemed to end this imaginary friend's visits. The house was put on the market at below market value. Uh, the new owners only stayed a few months, and then they suddenly packed up and moved out. A woman told her son, who was five, who developed imaginary friend. A woman told about her son, five, who had developed an imaginary friend. Her nephew, who was 15 at the time, had killed himself. The two boys had been very close, more like brothers than cousins. Not wanting to explain what suicide was, she told her son that his cousin had gotten sick and died. Soon after this, the imaginary friend showed up. Any time they visited her sister, the mother would remind her son not to pester his aunt about his dead son. Uh, they would visit a lot since they were family. One day, the son asked his mother why she kept telling him that his cousin was dead. She asked, what do you mean? He said that his cousin came by all the time. He would sit on his bed at night and they would talk. The mother was shocked. She tried to come up with questions as to who or, or what her son was seeing. She told her cousin, uh, he told her, his cousin had been visiting for months now. One day, maybe six months later, the dead cousin's grandfather passed away. The cousin came to visit and tell the boy that this was going to be his last visit. Him and his granddad were going on a trip together and they would not be back. The last thing he said was, don't play with guns. They're dangerous. The cousin had shot himself. A woman I am going to call Kathy used to tell folks about her imaginary friend who had light brown hair, always ran around in a nightgown, and had shiny stars where her eyes should have been. The folks listening would all say adult things until she just simply stopped talking about it. Years went by and Kathy moved away. One of her sisters moved back home with her young daughter. Kathy came home for a visit and her niece told her 
The girl with brown hair and stars for eyes says she misses you. I know her sister might have put her up to it, but I think not. This is one of those times the only explanation can be, we don't know. Steve and Jack were doing things that young boys do, which involves mud and their bodies. Uh, by the end of the day, they were both pretty messy. A quick run under the garden hose in order to get Jack back home, and then he borrowed some clothes from Steve. On the way home, the car he was riding in was involved in a collision, and, well, Jack went to the great playground in the sky. Steve's family went on with their lives, and the family grew, mostly staying in the one area. This led to lots of big family get-togethers. Around 2010, the family was having one of their parties, relatives in every part of the house and out in the yard. Steve, the niece, was playing by herself in one of the bedrooms. He glanced in to see how she was doing. Nancy said she was having fun playing with his friend Jack. Steve was confused by the statement, not connecting the dots. He just asked her, who is he? Nancy said, Jack said he was sorry that he was unable to return your clothes. Steve had to think hard. Realization came to him. The boy killed 30 years ago while wearing his clothing. There was no way she could have heard this from one of the family. Who would tell her so many details? Steve decided that Nancy was indeed playing with an imaginary friend who once was real. When Daniel was young, his imaginary friend looked just like him. Daniel would play all day with Derek not interested in any other kids in the neighborhood. Their relationship went on well past what most imaginary friends will last. Anytime Daniel's folks were around, Derek would stare at them with a sad look in his eyes. Eventually, Daniel did grow out of having an imaginary friend, and Derek went away to wherever imaginary friends go. Uh, the home for unwanted children and pets, perhaps. One day, Daniel was digging through some of his mother's old paperwork, the things you have to do when a parent dies. In a bunch of old official records, Daniel found a death certificate, filled out the same day that he had been born. It was listed as being for Derek, who was stillborn along with Daniel his twin brother that he never knew he had had. A two- or three-year-old boy used to play with his best imaginary friend, Johnny, who wore nothing but green clothes. His hat, shirt, pants, even his boots were green. One day, while the family was out for a drive, they were passing the cemetery when the boy announced that's where his friend Johnny lived. The father tried to explain what a cemetery was and how nobody actually lived there. They're all dead. His son said Johnny was a soldier and he died in some place called Nam. A young girl, Barbara, had an imaginary friend named Paris Jarvis. A Barbara's dad built a playhouse in the backyard close to the kitchen window so her mom, Gloria could keep an eye on her when she was playing. Barbara would hold tea parties all the time, passing around cups and plates of non-existent cookies. One day, Gloria was doing the dishes and listening in on the tea party. She heard, As long as I'm alive, nobody is going to hurt you. Gloria stopped what she was doing and listened closer. If you go and do that, I won't be able to help you. You know it's not nice to kill people. 
Gloria went out to find out what in the heck was going on inside her daughter's head. Barbara said that Paris was acting bad, and she, Barbara, had threatened her that she must behave. She had told Paris that she could not come play any more if she killed someone. Uh, quick questions for you parents out there. How would you handle that statement? The family moved to a new house, and they left the playhouse behind. A young boy told his mother that his imaginary friend was an older girl who said that she missed her and wished she could have stuck around for more than just one month. Her oldest son told her his imaginary friend missed her, the mom, and she wished that she could have been with her mother longer. It was one of those moments in life when the big hand of mystery slaps you upside the head. The mother had a daughter die from sudden infant death syndrome a year before she'd had her son. The daughter died when she was a month old. She had never mentioned this to her son. Two young sisters, Becky, six, and Dorothy, five, had the same imaginary friend named Narnie. Uh, it would drive their brother and their folks nuts how both girls could interact with an invisible friend. They both would look at the exact same spot, saying that was where Narnie was. They would both hear her saying the exact same things. The descriptions of this friend were the same. They both walk, would talk, as if this invisible girl was too real for comfort. If one said Narnie was doing something, the other would tell the same thing, never adding to it, never changing the story. It was always the same, even if they weren't hearing each other speak. If Narnie had said something, the two girls would get into a discussion with her that was all too well conducted to have been planned out and put together on the fly. A five- and six-year-olds can't keep this kind of thing up very long. Not just inside their minds. After watching this interaction for years, the family decided that there must be a ghost of some dead girl playing with their two girls. Children shouldn't play with dead things. That was a movie came out a long time ago. Ashley used to have a late-night visitor, not so much an imaginary friend, but an imaginary tormentor. She told people that this girl had long black hair that hung down over her face, just like Yaya. Instead of fingers, she had spiders attached to her hands. Ashley had put up with these visits until she turned 18, and then she immediately packed her bags and moved away. Years later, her half-brother, Trevor, was put in Ashley's old bedroom. It wasn't long before Trevor was telling the family about this weird dead girl uh, coming into his room at night. She had long black hair that hung down over her face and she had spiders instead of fingers. A woman had moved into an old apartment building. Her son began talking to an imaginary friend. She would hear him saying things about not being able to go outside because it was nighttime. She asked him about his new friend, and the boy said that his name was the Hat Man. When asked, he said this was because the friend always wore a big hat. The mom figured this was just his imagination, until one night she heard him telling the hat man that he could not go outside. This was followed by his bedroom door opening and then slamming shut. She quickly began looking for a new place to live. Vicar Manson uh, has sent me some newspaper articles from years ago, as in the early 1900s. A very young girl in Canada was playing in the yard when she vanished. The mother panicked and began searching everywhere. 
The family began looking all around the house, and then they began moving outwards. The girl was found as some ways away, walking along as if nothing was amiss. When the family caught up to her, the mother asked what the child was doing. She wasn't afraid of being so far from home, and there was no indication that she was concerned about the fact she had wandered off. She looked up as if speaking to some unseen adult and said she was having a beautiful walk with God. This was unexpected, and the mother simply wrote it off as childish imagination. I have to ask, would God leave a, lead a small girl far from her home and her mother? Or was there something else involved, maybe from the other realm? How about using your imaginary friend as a defense? In St. Louis, Martin Menzi had a dream in which his roommate was going to steal his money. Menzi told authorities that in his dream, his imaginary friend had told him that his roommate had made a key in order to get into his trunk and take all of his money. To keep this from happening, Menzi shot his roommate in the leg. I can't imagine trying to tell the police that my imaginary friend had told me to do something. You're looking at a very short trip to the nearest fun house. Uh, during a meeting between a teacher and a parent of one of their students, uh, the teacher was told that the seven-year-old boy was interacting with a ghost that lived in their grandparents' closet. The ghost was called the Captain. He was an old white guy with a long beard. The captain would tell the boy he needed to kill people when he got older. He was going to have a job where he would kill people. He would eventually get used to it. The boy would become upset and go crying to his mother. I read this article and I got to thinking, whose job involves killing? Maybe the military. Perhaps the boy was destined to grow up, join the military, and get used to his job. A three-year-old girl told her mother she had an imaginary friend named Kelly that lived in her closet. They would play during the day, and Kelly would sit in her rocking chair during the night. The usual motherly thing was to say, Ah, eh, that's nice, dear. A few years went by. The family was watching the Amityville Horror, uh, the one starring Ryan Reynolds. Anytime I see that guy, all I can think of is Deadpool. It doesn't matter what he's talking about or what he's doing. As Reynolds' daughter's eyes go all black, the daughter walked into the living room. She looked at the girl on the TV and said, That looks just like Kelly. The dead girl that lives in my closet. I have heard lots of stories about closets being portals. Why closets? After doing some reading and some digging around, I've come to the conclusion that because the backs of most closets are dark, and because you've got lots of things stuffed in there, it's an ideal place to put a portal. You'd hardly ever see it. You sure the heck wouldn't accidentally walk into it because people don't walk into their closets and walk all the way to the back wall. Perhaps that's what's going on. Portals are showing up in people's closets. Maybe that's why a lot of kids can't sleep with the closet door open. I'll bet most of you are going to pay a lot more attention to any imaginary friends that your kids come up with. It sounds more like these kids are interacting with ghosts and spirits than just their imagination. Hope you enjoyed tonight's show. If you did, tell your friends, tell your relatives, tell people you don't even know. They should be listening to, or watching, Strange Things with Chris James. 
If you're standing in line at the grocery store, tell people they should be listening or watching. If you want to support the show, you can do so simply by going to Amazon.com and buying one of my books. And I'll get the money. Well, most of it. You can get the Laredo Paranormal Research Society, Fort McIntosh and the Paranormal, Paranormal Laredo, or Paranormal Stories. Until next Saturday, this is Chris James for Strange Things. Are you, are you, coming to the tree, where they strung up a man, who they say he murdered three? Strange things have happened there, no stranger would it be, if we met, at midnight, in the hanging tree.